Hey everybody, this is Mr. Arvitus. I'm here for your coronavirus U.S. history lesson. Today's going to start off a series of lessons on World War II. And in fact, it'll be about two weeks long with about six or seven different videos posted about the Second World War. Today we're going to focus on Hitler's rise to power in Germany. I think this is one of the most important topics you can really go over because one of the questions we should always ask about Hitler and the Nazi Party's rise in you know Germany at the time is could that have happened in the United States? Could that happen to us? In almost every democratic country should ask that Germany was one of the most educated countries on earth. They had democracy. They had a republic at the time. And yet he still rose through that and people flocked to his movement in droves. And so today we'll kind of get a good look at Hitler. We'll get a good look at the way in which the Nazis rose to power. And we'll see just how devious they are from the very beginning. This isn't like, oh, they just kind of steered the wrong way. No, from the very beginning, the Nazi party's rise is built off of hate. It's built off of deception. Uh, it's built off of lies. And so we'll see See how Adolf Hitler becomes this demigod for people, becomes this guy that they just worship in a lot of ways. And so hopefully we'll see that throughout this lesson. And again, this will continue to, to forge our little back, kind of background on World War II prior to U.S. involvement. So to understand this, you really do have to understand the Versailles Treaty and hyperinflation, which kind of engulfs Germany after World War I. Uh, because the Nazi Party, let's be very honest, when we think about the Nazi Party, they're a fascist regime, they're racially discriminatory against people, uh, they're, they're not exactly like the group that you turn to when it's everything's sunny and rainbows outside. You go to the Nazi party when times are desperate. And that's what happened. Times got really desperate. And that's how the Nazis rose into power. They would not have rose into power if it were not for economic depressions, if it were not for joblessness and just the sheer despair after the Versailles Treaty. So that Versailles Treaty, as most of you know, ended World War I. And so hopefully you're all good history students. So you know that. So Versailles, it did a couple of different things. And we talked about this in my classes prior to Corona break. Uh, the Versailles Treaty did a couple of things to Germany's military. It limited the amount of soldiers they could have, right? It decreased their military. I mean, this is a country that had about 2 million standing soldiers, even in peacetime. And so when you decrease that military to being, you know, right around 100,000, less than 100,000, uh, that military all of a sudden, that's a vacuum of jobs that disappear. And not just from the military, from the support, from the, the businesses that produce all of the materials the military uses. They also reduced their airplane production. They couldn't produce military-grade aircraft, really couldn't produce any aircraft for a short period of time. So that kind of you know deep six, that, 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 that production line. Then you go into the Navy where they reduced the amount of battleships they had. They reduced the submarines. They said you could not produce any U-boats anymore because, remember, those were so destructive in World War I. So those things ultimately really hurt the Germany economy. You then factor in the psychological part, the guilt clause, right? Where at the Versailles Treaty, they said, this is Germany's fault and you're going to accept it. And, and we call it the guilt clause because Germany had to accept the guilt. They had to accept the blame for everything that was going on. And it, is it fair? I mean, we can debate about that all day. And if you want to leave a comment on that, that's fine. Uh, but you know, the reality is World War I was started for a lot of different reasons. Yes, Germany is an aggressor, but did they actually start the war? I don't know. One of the other big issues is going to be the reparations payments. So Germany is going to owe reparations to majority Britain and France, and we're talking 132 billion gold marks. So they're going to pay this off over time, and this is a lot of, a lot of money. And so Germany begins to increase their nominal value, right? They, they increase the money they're producing, and they're going to create a hyperinflation atmosphere. And so to put in perspective, in 1922, 300 gold marks equaled one U.S. dollar, okay? In 1923, 50,000 marks equaled one U.S. dollar. And so that's how bad Germany's economy went. The, the money literally wasn't worth the paper it was printed on. And so you can see in the picture here, I love this picture because it kind of gives you a, a good mindset of, you know, these are kids and they're just stacking up these, these dollars. Um, and it really, it, it's a game to them. You have people who burned them during the winter. You had you know, pictures of old ladies carrying barrels going forward. And it's this atmosphere where a young Hitler kind of comes into, into his own. And there's a lot of angry people, right? Hitler is one of a lot of people. I hope we understand that. He is not the misnomer. He's one of a lot of angry ex-soldiers who don't have a place in that world. So let's talk about Hitler and who he is. So Hitler, when we look at Hitler, right, Hitler is Austrian, right? He's born in Austria. Um, as some, some people kind of know right? he goes to art school. Some people say, oh, the reason he hated Jews so much was because of this art school thing. It, 
that's not why the Holocaust happened. It's not because he got rejected from art school, right? Um, Hitler was a house painter, as Winston Churchill always liked to call him, uh, rather insultingly. Uh, he was a soldier in World War I for the German army. He enlisted for the Germans, and he was fairly decent. He carried messages. He gets wounded badly in combat, um, almost died, but we didn't luck out on that one. And he got hit by mustard gas and actually had some, a bunch of infections in his lungs and respiratory areas, stuff that carried with him his entire life. Um, now, Hitler is actually working for the German government at a certain period of time. And so when he's working for the German government, he's actually spying on the Nazis. And so Hitler would actually go to the beer halls in Munich and he would spy on the Nazis. And so he's going every day. He's saying, oh, man, these stupid Nazis. He'd write down what they're saying. And then, you know, as the, the weeks and months went on, he started to be like, man, these guys have, have a good idea. He didn't start the Nazi party. He joins it when someone asks him to speak. And you know, Hitler did not have very many friends growing up. He did not have very many friends in the army, though that was the only time he felt belonging was in that army. And so when he was asked to speak at this beer hall, he gets up and he gives this very inflamed speech. And, and hopefully all of you, I would recommend Googling or going onto YouTube as you're on right now and watching Hitler speak. Uh, in particular, uh, there's a couple of really good ones that you can watch that will kind of show you his speaking style. His arms are... It looks like they're going everywhere, but everything he does is actually by design. And his first speech wasn't like that, but it's very fiery. He goes in there, and the message that he kind of you know points out is that you know we didn't lose World War One. The government lost World War One, and we need to you know think about why do we have this government? Why are they in charge? And for all those you know former soldiers who were sitting there like, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. And so Hitler kind of romanticizes World War One in this this lost war that they really won, but the government forfeited, and they start pinning it on the communists. Now, people sometimes I think misassociate Hitler's fascism and they say it's it's like Marxism. Hitler hates communism, okay? Please make sure you understand that. Don't be that guy who kind of says that they're the same thing. They're not the same thing. They're not even close to being the same thing. Um, Hitler hates Marxists. And actually, the Marxist revolt that took place in Germany, that's one of the things that Hitler points out as to why they lose World War I. It's one of the things that he says that's why uh, they're going through a depression right now. And he also points out Jews in this as well. Uh, his hatred of Jews is actually fairly common. And we'll talk about this a little bit further when we get to the Holocaust. You know, Hitler, like a lot of Germans at the time, did not like Jews because a lot of Jews were migrants, right? They had, they had moved in during various time periods over the past 40 or 50 years. And so they didn't like them from that perspective. And then there was just, it was a different social kind of, kind of thing going on, right? They dressed different. They looked different. And so uh, the persecution is actually something that had occurred uh, a lot. I always tell my classes to read a book called The Butcher's Tale, where it kind of highlights anti-Semitism at a very uh, early point. And Hitler is right in, in, in that, that area. So Hitler in the early 20s, right? When, when he's kind of rising up, he's going to meet the head of the Nazi party who's actually going to groom him. Uh, Hitler didn't have any good clothes. The mustache you see here is not how he looked originally. Um, he's going to get him a tailor. He's going to teach him how to speak. He's going to practice in the mirror relentlessly uh, all the poses and things that he does as he talks. And you'll see he does a lot of arm motions. He does things like that. He moves his hands. All that stuff is practiced. And so Hitler is very, very organized. Now, his following grows very, very quickly in the 20s. We see a number of different people who watch him speak, who get kind of hooked on his his kind of speaking. Rudolf Hess is one of these guys who watches him. Uh, and now the Netflix had a documentary about Hitler's inner circle, and they make Hess kind of seem like a fanboy in, in a way. And he kind of is in, in a lot of ways. Hermann Goring, though, is going to be the guy that the Nazis get. Hermann Goring is in the same fighter squadron as the Red Baron in World War One, he, ha he is one of the best surviving German pilots. He's very famous. He's from Prussia. He's a rich guy. And he really bought into Hitler in the 1920s. And so he's going to kind of go along with everything Hitler's kind of preaching and kind of move it forward. So one of the big theories that you have to know whenever you do this section is the stab in the back theory. Um, the stab in the back theory is very simple. Uh, the Germans believe that they win the war. Uh, the average German soldier, so people in Hitler's generation, they said, hey, we won the war. We didn't lose the war, we won. But that's not the case. They did indeed lose the war. It's like collective amnesia goes over all, all of these, these Nazis, and they think, oh, well, well, you know, it was just the government. It was the communists, right? It was the Jews who lost the war, right? It was these groups of people. And so Hitler, it, you know, this theory isn't just something he does, right? There's other people who subscribe to this as well, uh, and Hermann Goring is one of them. And the stab in the back theory became very, very popular amongst former soldiers. And we talk about organizations like the SA, which we will in a second. 
that organization is filled with these types of guys who believe that they didn't lose the war. The war was lost by their government. Now, this picture, I always like to joke around in class. Can you find Hitler in this picture? And a lot of people go with the guy who is bottom right. They go with top uh, left. But really, there's an X over who he is. So X does mark the spot sometimes. So the SA, the SA is created uh, in in Germany in 1920, okay? The SA, the Strombolang, right? The stormtroopers, these are former World War I soldiers. They wore brown shirts, so they were known as the brown shirts. Um, it's very similar to a group that Mussolini started called the Black Shirts, also former World War I soldiers, also unemployed, also want to get rid of the powers that be. And so Hitler and the SA become kind of synonymous with each other. And it's going to be here all right, that, that Hitler and the other Nazis begin to kind of organize. And, they, and not just organizing in a political setting, because they really didn't do well at winning elections in the early 20s. Um, they really couldn't get anybody elected. But it's here that they're going to say, hey, maybe we need to do like Mussolini. Mussolini, if you, you know, as you learn in the next couple of sections, in the early 20s, Mussolini, just right before this, had marched to Rome with his black shirts and took Rome and became the president of Italy. Now, Ernest Rahm, who's in charge of the SA, former soldier, big time guy, you know, he's going to be kind of Hitler's right hand man on this. And they are going to march on Munich, right? Munich being the new capital of Germany. Uh, it's where the Reichstag was. It's you know the cultural center of Germany, and they're going to organize a march, and that march is going to be known as the Beer Hall Push. The Beer Hall Push takes place in September of 1923, and so Adolf Hitler and Nazis they began to march out, and and, and they, they're going to take the Reichstag hostage, and that's the idea. They're going to storm the Reichstag, and they actually do take a couple people hostage. They're at a beer hall, and they're going to hold them in that beer hall. Some of them are major parliamentary members of the German parliament. Uh, some of them are major military members, and the hope is that the military will join the Nazis and overthrow the German government. That's not what happened, okay? The beer hall push, in a lot of ways, was, a, was just an absolute disaster for Hitler. Uh, he almost dies. He could have gotten shot and killed. Hermann Goring gets shot in the leg, and he's going to suffer uh, from that. He actually escapes, does not go to jail, but he, he escapes to Austria, I believe. He's going to end up being addicted to morphine for a while. Uh, it gains a lot of weight, all that other fun stuff, but uh, Goring's going to really kind of get, get beat up over this. Now, Hitler does get captured. Him and a number of other uh, Nazis get captured. And so in the picture you see here, uh, it's a picture of all, like some of the major Nazis in the beer hall push, like Ludendorff and those guys. And so Hitler is going to go on trial in 1923 after the beer hall push. His trial is kind of remarkable. It's the first modern trial in German history. Uh, they, they broadcast parts of it on the radio. More specifically, they transcribe a lot of it in newspapers. And Hitler is kind of put on stage a little bit. And I don't think people realize this. When he went to testify, everything he said was being transcribed and put in newspapers. And they have a couple times where it's on radio, right, on broadcast. And so Hitler uses this opportunity just to spread his message. And so when the new judges, you know, in the German trials would say, you know, did you try and take the Reichstag hostage? And you'd be like, you know what really is taking hostage is the Versailles Treaty on Germany, okay? It's the fact that our government doesn't support us. And he would just rail against the government. And you have some of the judges who are kind of like nodding along and saying, yeah, I kind of agree with you. And so Hitler kind of gets this free PR moment for this trial. Um, though he does get sentenced to jail, um, he does go to jail during this, and, and that's something I think we, we can kind of account for. Um, he was supposed to go to jail for five to ten years. He serves a total of eight months in prison, serves a total of eight months in prison. Uh, his cellmate's going to help him write a book called Mein Kampf, Mein Kampf, My Struggle. And through that book, Hitler is going to outline the ideology of the Nazi party. OK, in a lot of ways, it reads like a lot of rants and raves. And that's really what, what Hitler was kind of doing. And, and you have Hess just kind of transcribing it. But Mein Kampf becomes a very popular book. Now, when Hitler gets out, uh, he actually can't speak publicly. He's supposed to be banned from speaking publicly for a long period of time, though they waived that in 1929. And so Hitler is going to be underground campaigning. He still speaks at beer halls. He's still the head of the Nazi party. But as Germany's economy got better in 1924 and 25, the Nazi party decreased in popularity and people really didn't like it. And so it's going to take something new for the Nazis to come into power. It's going to take a global depression, which the United States will be at the forefront of. And so from 1924 to 1932, we see that happen, right? So the Nazis don't rise in power. When we get to 1929, right, the United States stop investing in Germany. We stop lending Germany money. They default on loans. 
1930, guess what? The, eto- the economy tanks. The economy tanks. And so as the economy is tanking, people begin to buy into Hitler and his Nazi party. Okay? And when we say they buy into it, they begin to win support. Okay? By 1930, 35, right, they're starting to get massive amounts of support, over 30% of the seats in the Reichstag, right? And then eventually in the 1932 election, this is the first time Hitler runs for public office, Hitler is going to run for president. And now he does not win this election, and I think that's very important. He loses to Paul von Hindenburg, who was 80 years old. Um, now Hindenburg and Hitler actually f- go off in a, in a runoff election. for It's 30 days after the, the regular election. And Hitler is going to do the first modern campaigning in Germany. He's going to fly to, you know, in 30 days, I want to say he goes to 90 cities and gives like 100 speeches. And so Hitler does very, very well in this, but he doesn't beat Hindenburg. Uh, Hindenburg wins. Except Hitler's still going to get into power because the Nazis end up controlling large amounts of the Reichstag. And so Hindenburg is going to allow Hitler to become chancellor or head of government. And so Hitler becomes the chancellor, and then there we go. But Hindenburg's still there to protect. Except remember, the dude is 80. Like a swift breeze could knock him off in the 1930s, and he did. He died. Uh, Hindenburg died in 1934, and that kind of paves the way for that. Well, so the election happens, 1933, Hitler is named chancellor. Except there's going to be more to this, right? The Nazi rise isn't as simplistic as just, oh, here we go, it's over. Hitler is going to consolidate, right? Hermann Göring, who you see in the picture with Hitler, we see uh, Ernest Rahm in here, we see uh, Heinrich Himmler, and we also see Joseph Goebbels in this picture. Uh, Goebbels all the way to the left, Rahm in the center, Hitler and Göring front and center, and then Himmler, of course, in that corner. Um, he, he immediately appoints a lot of Nazis into various positions. They're also going to create the Gestapo and the, and the SS around this same time period because there's going to be a tragedy that kind of alleviates uh, the need for restrictions on government. And that, stra- that, that tragedy is going to be the Reichstag fire. Now, there's no direct evidence that says the Nazis started the fire in 1933 that burnt down the Reichstag, but there's a lot of just small little pieces that you kind of add up. And so the Reichstag, which is their version of Congress, right? Imagine if the Capitol building in the United States was lit on fire by arsonists. What would the reaction be? How would people react to that? Well, they didn't react very well, okay? Hitler's going to be given emergency power. They immediately blame the communists who confess upon being tortured and executed. And so Hitler kind of has a martial law. It's supported by the people, um, and they, they really kind of outlaw communism. Now, communists had won a bunch of political seats in the Reichstag, and so that political party is going to be eliminated. He then looks at the Liberal Party in Germany and eliminates that as well because they're almost close to communists. Now, the Nazis related to the Conservative Party a lot more, and they're going to kind of engulf that. Now, whenever they eliminate these political parties, the seats are appointed by the by, by Hitler, and so it's Nazis that go into power. And so the Reichstag will be completely controlled by the Nazis uh, following the Reichstag fire of 1933, and Hitler kind of takes control over that. Um, Now, do we know exactly who did it or or, or everything else? A lot of people say the SA probably had a lot to do with it. And as we talk, the Night of Long Knives, which eliminates the SA, you know, is definitely not coincidental. We also see the creation of the first concentration camp, and that is Dachau. Uh, Dachau is created in 1933 for political prisoners and primarily communists at the time. Approximately 31,000 people are killed at Dachau. And Dachau was used to get rid of all the political prisoners that Hitler didn't like. Um, Eventually, it's going to be home to a number of different people. Um, The U.S. liberates this in April of 1945. Uh, There's a great little scenario that we'll kind of go over in class about this as well. But Dachau was started right here. So for those of you who are like, oh, well, you know, the Holocaust doesn't start until much later. Well, Dachau, the first concentration camp, starts here. It starts in 1933, uh, and then it continues all the way through 45. So something to kind of consider as you guys are, are, are studying this further. So Hitler is born. Now, how has Hitler become the Fuhrer, right? Um, well, during this crisis, he was, he was given the Enabling Act. The Enabling Act suspended freedom of speech, more or less, uh, and it suspended a number of other rights against the German people. Now, what they did for Hitler is Hitler is going to appoint a guy named Joseph Goebbels. Joseph Goebbels is going to get on the radio all the time and give addresses, and they're actually going to have a radio give-out program, very similar to the United States did with, with different electrification programs, where they give radios out to the average person so they can hear these addresses from Goebbels. 
Um, Hitler promises economic reforms. He says the only way to get Germany out of this depression is through emergency action. And so we see a very similar tone in 1933 in the United States where they had emergency actions. Except here, it's all about rearming the military, right? This isn't the New Deal, okay? This isn't the creating the FDIC. This is creating the SS. So I think that that's an important thing to kind of differentiate as you go forward with this. Hitler is given these with the approval of parliament, okay? Uh, they end up eliminating foreign uh, or, or, or well, foreigners in general begin to be deported at this time. And we are going to start to see the early indications of the Nuremberg Laws kind of going forward. And this picture, you know, this picture is actually, I think, from 1938. But I think it's important to understand that there's kind of like a, almost like a weird cult when it comes to Hitler. And you look at this picture and you look at the faces of the people in the crowd. And there's just this sheer admiration for this guy. And these women are just trying to touch his hand, you know, looking almost euphoric. And so Hitler is a very, very popular individual. Now, before we get to, you know, his political movements, let's also talk about where Hitler, you know, gained his real support. And that was through kids. And this isn't something people like to hear, but Hitler almost immediately when he takes power revamps Germany's public schooling. And public schooling is going to be a Nazification of schooling, right? And there are going to be teachers that are arrested. There's going to be imprisonments on that end. And they're going to be teaching them the Nazi kind of way of life. And by 1934, after the Enabling Act, that public schooling is producing Nazis. That's the goal of it. And so I think it's really important to understand he controls the media. Everything has to go through Goebbels that's going to be published. So they control that. They shut down every Jewish newspaper, every opposition newspaper in the country. And then education-wise, they control the hearts and minds of the people as they are growing up. And so you, you okay, so these kids in this picture from 1935, and you're like, all right, you know, maybe maybe a couple of these kids, like the kid with the blonde hair, the one in the middle might be, what, 11, maybe a 10-year-old next to them. Well, in 1945, these kids are, are 20 and 21. They're fighting on the Russian front. They're fighting in, 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 you know, against the U.S. as we push into Germany. And they have a love for Hitler because that's all they've known. And so education becomes a big part of this. And by the way, that's the same with Japan. It's the same with Russia. It's the same with Italy. Education is the controlling mechanism they use to create a youthful movement. And Hitler spoke at the Hitler Youth Rallies all the time. The Hitler Youth was actually started earlier and was kind of like almost like a summer program, but then it gets instituted in schools, uh, kind of like you know the fascist Boy Scouts, if you will, right? And they're like the ultra Hitler supporters. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about this, and we're almost done. But the SS and Heinrich Himmler, right? 1900, 1945. Himmler's alive. Himmler is like the little guy who couldn't serve in the military. He always wanted to be in the military, and. World War I ended, and so he always likes to play the role as soldier, if you will. He doesn't fight. He's not a guy who actually picks up guns except when he, he you know, tries to kill himself. But Himmler uh, is, is in charge of the SS and the Gestapo. He gets in charge of both of those things. Originally, the Gestapo is run by Hermann Goering, but Himmler's going to take that from him. Um, the SS is like the replacement for the SA. These are the elite Nazi soldiers. They are soldiers loyal to Hitler. They're not loyal to Germany. They're loyal to Hitler. Right And the SS, and you see the lightning bolt symbol on there, um, these were the crack troops of Germany. Now, there's also a lot of racial ideology in there. Okay, um, They had to be uh, by percentage German. They got tested on these things. Uh, they had a physical fitness test they had to have met. They had all sorts of different qualifications, intelligence testing. And so the SS is, is you know, obviously one of the more highly qualified groups. Now, the SS also has multiple branches, and I hope we understand that. Uh, for people who kind of were sociopathic, they put them in, in eventually the death squads that we'll talk about when they invade Poland and Russia. These were people who went out, and specifically their target was to go to the record halls and then to round up all the Jews, all the gypsies, all the people uh, who, who may have served in the military and shoot them. And so they do have certain people in the SS that are in that, that category. Um, your average SS soldier um, is just kind of their version of the elite soldiers. But remember, they are pure Nazis. I mean, these guys, they, they live it, right? They're, they're not just, you know, Nazis by day because Hitler's in charge. Uh, if they're in the SS, they this is their creed, right? This is what they go for. Now, the SS had a lot of conflict, and that conflict centered around the SA, and so Ernest Rahm ran the SA, okay? Ernest Rahm ran the SA, and Ernest Rahm did not get along with Heinrich Himmler. And so Heinrich Himmler, 
as a part of what will eventually be known as the Night of Long Knives, had recordings of Ernest Rahm talking about Hitler. Rahm had become increasingly concerned in 1934 and 35, right, that Hitler was going to, or 1934, that he was going to start another world war. And so Himmler is going to kind of put into Hitler's mind that Ernest Rahm is kind of going after him. And on June 30th, 1934, Hitler is going to sign off on Operation Hummingbird. In Operation Hummingbird, we know as the Night of Long Knives. In one night, the SS will arrest the entirety of the SA. Uh, Ernest Rahm uh, will be essentially arrested and told to, to admit to his crimes. Uh, and he gets handed a gun. He doesn't want to do it, so they shoot him. Uh, they shoot a number of them. A lot of the SA are going to be reinstituted in the German army. But some people also look at this as the Munich part of the SA in particular got hit hard. And some people say basically anyone who was in that Reichstag fire uh, was eliminated in this in this period. But some of them are relocated and everything else. Now Heinrich Himmler consolidates power. He becomes the head of the SS. The SA is engulfed by the SS. And he also becomes the head of the Gestapo. And so that, that becomes his kind of major deal. So that's where we're going to end it today. Uh, that's Hitler's kind of rise to power, elimination of the SS and the SA. Uh, next class or, or the next lesson I post is going to be more on Mussolini and more on Japan and Russia. But I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, follow through with it. We're going to have assignments if you're in my class. If not, I'll see you later. This is Mr. Arvidas with U.S. History.